All right, yeah, so my name is John Kohler, and I have uh, several YouTube channels. I've also been doing a raw food diet since 1995, maybe even longer than some of the people that have been speaking here have been alive, because I know they're fairly young. Um, and I got into this because of a health opportunity, I like to call it now. I almost lost my life by spinal meningitis and was hospitalized, and um, the doctor said I might not make it out of the hospital alive. And so when I got out of the hospital, I said, well, why did I get this disease? Because one of the things I learned in life is to, um, you know, to learn and grow, you need to ask better questions. And so he said, you have basically a compromised immune system and you could get sick with this disease or another disease in the future because your immune system is weak. And that didn't really surprise me a whole lot because as a child, I had asthma, allergies, um, and all these other, you know, uh, basically autoimmune conditions. Um, which were coming out as my the symptoms that I was experiencing. Um, before I go on further, I have a few handouts. I didn't bring enough because the printer at the hotel was not working properly. Um, I will hand out uh, these guys, which I will reference in a minute. And at the end of my talk, if you guys want, I have only a few copies of my whole talk, although my talk will be online on my YouTube channel for you guys to review later. I do have a few handouts. If you really would like one, come to me after the presentation. I'll be glad to hand you guys one. And so the next question I have is, how many people here eat 100% pure fruit, meaning no vegetable diet, by a show of hands? All right, good. That makes me kind of happy. No. Um, and then, so how many people here are on a fruitarian diet with vegetables? And then how many people are on a raw food diet, which may not well, they shouldn't be including fruits and vegetables, but maybe not necessarily, but just raw diet. So good, most people are fruit-based with vegetables. That's awesome. I think that's definitely the way to go. I mean, there's pros to doing an all-fruit diet, but there's also some significant cons, and I have, I have one friend that literally eats 99% of fruits with very little vegetables, and he, he thrives, but he's in Hawaii on 10 acres, and he grows all his own food. I do not recommend living entirely on fruit, especially with store-bought fruit. Um, with, which is something I'll be discussing today. Um, so the next question I have is how many people currently follow me on YouTube? I have three YouTube channels. The one I'll be mostly interested in today is OK Raw, which is where I teach my raw food teachings. OK, good. Maybe about half of you. So half of you guys don't know me. This is good to know. Um, aside from OK Raw, where I have my raw food teachings, I have over um, 500 episodes, uh, just diving into different aspects of raw foods or fruit-based, uh, fruit and vegetable-based diet and how to do it as best as possible. I interview many doctors and people doing it, even some of my friends have been doing it a long time. And for example, my friend David, unfortunately had a stroke on a raw food diet. And you know, he found out why, and in the video we uncover why and what you need to do to prevent getting a stroke on a raw food diet, because although you would think being vegan or raw, you would not get a stroke, it is possible and you know, partly is eating the wrong foods, but other things are things like stress, which can really cause a lot of challenges. Those are the kind of videos I like to uncover. And this is you know, not only for me, but to share this with the world because I'm on my own health journey and this is what I like to share. This is one of my passions in life and this is just simply what I do. Uh, the, my second channel that I like actually more than my, even my raw food channel, it's called Growing Your Greens. And that's where I'm really into teaching people about growing their own food and becoming familiar with the food you're eating and growing the highest quality food. This is something that you can't do, unfortunately, even at a farmer's market or Whole Foods. Um, by growing your own food, it opens a wide amount of possibilities. While I, it is called growing your greens, I don't just grow greens, I focus on growing greens myself. I do have lots of episodes on food forests and growing fruit trees, as well as have many fruit trees myself, although I'm waiting to get acres until I go full forward with a whole on fruit orchard. So it's about growing fruits and vegetables and eating high fruit and vegetable content on that on that YouTube channel. And then my third YouTube channel is uh, youtube.com slash raw foods. And this is the shameless plug. I do sell juicers, dehydrators, and vacuum blenders for a living. That's how I make a living. That's how I'm able to be here today and uh, share everything I do. So if you guys need one of those items, please visit my website, discountjuicers.com. And then on my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash raw foods, that's where I review all the different equipment that will allow you to process and eat more fruits and vegetables in the best way possible. And I'll be talking also a little bit about this uh, today as well. And so I handed everybody out one of these, which we'll be talking about in a minute. But my main talk today is, you know, I really want to encourage you guys to always strive to improve your diet. Even if you think, oh man, I'm eating a, 
you know, raw fruit and vegetable based diet, that's like the best diet on the planet. And for many reasons it may be, but also it may be deficient for some reasons, which I might talk about a little bit. Um, I always want you guys to improve. And so even me, after doing a raw foods diet, raw fruit and vegetable based diet now for the last 24 years, I'm still finding ways to improve. And that's what I like to share. And that's what I want to motivate you guys today. So with my talk, I'm basically sharing my 24 years of experience on a fruit and vegetable based diet with you guys so that you guys don't have to go through the, the hardships, the troubles, the pain, the toils that I've been through. If you guys start implementing some of these 10 steps that I'll be sharing with you guys today, this is an advanced topic that you know, I don't have a video on, but if you follow me regularly, um, you know, all these all these topics I've covered in this video or that video, and you'd have to watch all my videos to know all these things, but now it's gonna be one video for all the viewers on YouTube today and for you guys here, and, and you guys here also get to ask me questions after, which is, I think, uh, personally invaluable. So the talk title today is 10 Ways to Increase Your Health, Energy, and Performance by Making Dietary Changes. And these are 10 simple steps, steps and these aren't things that I just like learned overnight, you know, it's like maybe after five years I learned one of these, after 10 years I learned another one, and then some of these are more kind of like recent things that kind of came into my perception, but now you guys get to do them or have the choice. Maybe you guys think I'm full of BS. I like to think I'm fairly pragmatic and, you know, I do change my opinions on things over time. So if you see an old video where I promote something and a new video, John, you're controversial compared to what you said five years ago, well, that's because I'm always evolving and changing as I believe everybody should be. And this is totally fine. This is how we learn and grow. And I think one of the big challenges in, in you know, whatever kind of fruitarian, raw food lifestyle is a lot of the dogma that's out there. But that's what it says in the book. That's what I'm going to do. And people just stick to their guns on what's in there. And we've learned a lot of things in some of the original, you know, books that have come out about this topic. And I would encourage you guys to, you know, not be sheeple in life and just follow people. Oh, I'm gonna do exactly what John does. If you're me and you're a clone of me, do exactly what I do because I've got your work for me. But we're all so intrinsically different and we all need to maybe modern, we can have a nice base of what we're gonna do, but we all need to change things just a little bit, tweak it for us and even more importantly, our microbiome that I'll also be talking about today. Um, so yeah, one of the, I want you guys to literally be like artificial intelligence, which is now, you know, uh, buzzword. Artificial intelligence is a program that basically learns by seeing, repeating, and doing things. I mean, to, as a layman, I know there's some computer nerds out here that can explain that better, but the computer is self-learning, so as it goes along and does math problems or something, it can learn and, and um, estimate or guess what's going to happen next time when this happens, and we should all be doing that you know, as people learning and evolving and changing, not just sticking to like, this is what I do and I'm not going to change it up. Um, you know, in my opinion. So the first way I want you guys to improve is increase the quantities of fruits, vegetables, leafy greens, herbs you're eating. You know, I know some of you guys may be raw vegan, some of you guys didn't raise your hand on any of the things I talked about. Maybe some of you guys eat conventional food, just had came from McDonald's or just vegan, having vegan junk foods. I mean, the one thing I will say to people in YouTube land watching this or you guys, and even like my brother, my brother was out visiting me in Las Vegas where I live for the last week. And you know, I got to spend a lot of time with my nephew. He's 10 years old. And he, I mean, at 10 years old, you are quite influential. And I'm glad to say that I'm a good influence on my nephew because unfortunately my brother is not. I mean, my brother will take my nephew to Smashburger, which, you know, just toils me because not only the animals, these are my, because it's like, not really healthy food at all, and that's not really food I would put into my child. But it's not my choice what he's doing with his child. But now that Nico is 10 years old, you know, Nico has a voice, he has a choice. So I try to be a positive role model, and like when I was spending some time with him, I'm like, Nico, you know, if you eat fruits and vegetables, you can be healthy, like Uncle John, and you know, my brother, he came out to visit me. My brother's now top of the scales at 190 pounds. He looks like some of the pictures you guys saw from earlier, but the before pictures of some of the people that were here, you know, that before they got on raw food. My, my brother's like that. He's like years younger than me. He looks older than me. And he's just puffed and ballooned out. And he's, he's a PE teacher, so he definitely gets more physical activity than I do, which is something I need to improve on. I'm not perfect. Um, but he eats just garbage. And he has all these shoulder problems. And, you know, uh, just he has, like, some things going on with his feet now. And I'm like, you know, minimal health challenges, you know. Um, but anyways, with my nephew, I told him, like, Nico, you have, every meal you eat, you have a choice. You can eat healthy or you can eat unhealthy. 
Even if your dad's taking a smash burger and he has a coupon to get a two for one deal, you can tell your dad, Dad, I don't want to eat smash burger. I'll need some fruits and vegetables because I want to feel healthy, I want to feel good after I eat because my nephew, I mean, he'll notice after he eats the food, he doesn't feel good. He maybe feels tired, like after a big Thanksgiving meal or after smash burger, which is full of fat, sugar, and oil. You know, it just, it just, it's hard on you, even for a kid, you know, it'll slow you down in my, my uh, nephew pays baseball. So, I mean, some of the best athletes eat, you know, plant-based food, plant-based diet, they don't clog you up as much as, you know, high artery clogging foods. So I'm glad I, you know, and he, my brother told me, he's like, John, after he goes over here the other day, he's like, I'm going to get smash burger, and he goes, said, I don't want to eat smash burger, Dad. I want some fruits and vegetables. That just made me cry. So I want all you guys out there, you know, every meal you have, even if you're not eating the healthiest sweets right now, you always have a choice. You can change. You don't have to do the same thing that you've been doing it, you know, your whole life. And so I want you to increase the quantity of fruits and vegetables if you're not on already on this diet, number one. I mean, plant foods are full of phytochemicals and phytonutrients. These are the properties that, in my opinion, keep us young, keep us healthy, keep disease away. Allow more better, allow our brain cells to have, you know, to work more efficiently, our neurons connect better. One of the things I've noticed after doing a Rocky diet all these years is my reaction times are faster now than when I started a Rocky diet, which is insane. Like, if I'm eating a fruit and it's like, I, it slips out of my hand for some reason, I could just be like, boom, and it's like in my hand and I didn't even have to think about it. Like, before I couldn't do that and I used to play actually sounds funny, but I used to play championship air hockey and in the state of California at some at one point I think I was ranked like seventh in the state. And now if I played air hockey, I'd be so much better. I had a dream about playing air hockey because my reaction time is so much faster than the putts coming down, I can be like I can be blocking it and stuff. I don't know if I'll get back into that, but it was, it was fun. Um, but yeah, so there's so many different things and we're not really aware. I mean people eat McDonald's and you get the guy next to me can stand next to McDonald's who's working out at the gym and be as fit as true as I am. But I mean, just things aren't working properly. I mean, looks are one judge of health, but there's so many others, you know, like my blood tests, which I'm not deficient in iron and uh, beta carotene or the pro vitamin A that comes from the beta carotene, um, you know, so that's also dependent on your genes. Uh, so, number one is increase your quantity of fruits and vegetables, leafy greens, and herbs for eating. Number two, this is important for all you guys here, the people that raise their hands who are already on a fruit-based diet, fruit vegetable, or even raw food diet, is better balance specific quantities, oh no, sorry, better balance of fruits and vegetables and fats you're eating. Each food has specific qualities, traits, phytonutrients, fats, calories, and foods have different roles in the body. So if you're like, you know, if you're on a fruit-based diet eating like bananas and dates to get your calories in, because maybe you live in Denmark or somewhere and that's what you could get, and you need to get your calories, um, you know, these foods, while they are high calorie food, they don't have as much nutrition as maybe some berries that also grow in Denmark in the season. And, you know, other, you know, like I eat dried, um, you know, tart cherries and dried, you know, freeze dried cherries. You know, instead of eating dates, which are much more higher antioxidant foods, um, you know, than simply dates and bananas. You know, it's rare that I eat bananas. The other thing about bananas we learned today, thanks to one of the uh, speakers is that you know they're they're monoculture raised. So when you are buying even organic bananas, you know that are imported, you're supporting monoculture where they're literally slashing and burning forests so they could plant these plantation of bananas. So that you guys buy your organic 69 cent bananas. So whenever I travel, you know I, I, I went to the farmers market this morning. I tried to eat as much local food, locally grown food as I possibly can from local farmers. Super important. But what do I mean by balance or fruit, vegetables, and fats you're eating? So I mean, I know one of the speakers early basically be, eats very little, if any, overt fats. You know, my personal opinion is that overt fats such as nuts, seeds, avocados, I'm not talking about oil, I do not recommend or, or eat oil in any high quantities or any quantities myself aside from some DHA oil, which is for uh, uh, medicinal reasons. But we need to balance all these things, and I'm not here to tell you guys, oh, you need to eat 80, 10, 10, or I'm not here to tell you any percentages. Um, but I, I do like, I do believe that, you know, uh, fat percentages are important to, to absorb some of the different phytonutrients more efficiently and in higher uptakes than without them. So if you're excluding all fats, you know, you may not be getting as high of a, you know, intake from some of the phytonutrients that are in, especially some of the leafy greens and vegetables. So I always do recommend something like, uh, you know, a little, a little, little handful, you know, maybe an ounce or two of nuts or seeds in with your salad dressing. So now you increase the absorption of some of the nutrients in that salad. 
You know, one of the things I like to do is I like to add a little bit of coconut milk um, that I make fresh um, into my high antioxidant juices. So if you saw me earlier, I was drinking uh, cactus root juice, mostly purple cactus roots, with a little bit of blended coconut meat, young coconut meat, and water in there to add some a uh, little bit more sweetness, although it's quite sweet, but also to increase my uptake of some of the phytonutrients in there. A challenge I see a lot with a lot of people is if they don't have a savory palate, which most people unfortunately don't have a savory palate, they have a sweet palate, they eat far too many fruits and they neglect the vegetables or the non-sweet fruits and especially the leafy green vegetables and even other root vegetables, you know. Um, the carrots are a super important food if you gave me the choice, and I'll make a video on this, on this one of these days, between like a cup of carrot juice, you know, that maybe is a cup is like uh, 16 ounces, actually I usually would drink maybe 24, and that'd be like three pounds of carrots or like, you know, this equivalent amount of calories in bananas, I would choose the carrot juice every single time. But y'all, the carrot juice, man, it doesn't have any fiber. It, it's extracted, it's processed, right? Well, you know, so here's the thing, like, when you juice carrots, you remove some of the fiber. There's two kinds of fiber that's normally identified, there's many kinds, soluble and insoluble fiber. When you're juicing carrots, you remove the insoluble fiber, that's what comes out of the juicer, but the soluble fiber stays with the juice because it's soluble, it, it dissolves in water, so you're still getting about half the cacao, half the fiber in there. But here's the thing between bananas and carrots, number one, carrots are grown lo more local to me than bananas. I mean, they're still probably monoculture raised, not good, but the carrots are also a lot more higher in phyto phytonutrients than bananas are. You know, they got all the beta carotenes that are good for your eyes and that we need to convert into vitamin A that protect us from the sun and the bananas, unless it's like a fainy banana that's like, orange, which are extremely rare, um, you know, they don't have any, they have minimal quantities, if any, of beta carotene. They're going to be sun protective for you and maybe even color your orange if you have a nice fair skin. And this is protected from the inside of us. So, uh, yeah, so it's important just to get a proper balance. Uh, and I'm not going to tell you the exact, you know, numbers or quantities I eat. And what I will, I, I also want you to think about um, over time, as you guys evolve and change in your specific diet, you're gonna have to change some of the quantities. You know, I've noticed as I'm getting more mature in my age, I am eating less fruit than I used to. You know, I'm not piling in the fruit. I'm not eating as many calories as I used to either. That's also probably because of my fruit and food now is more nutrient dense than say when I started, when I had to eat a lot more dry fruits. Nowadays, you know, dry fruits are like a treat. I don't like really eat dry fruits because they're missing their water content. Uh, the third tip I wanna give you guys is you wanna focus on micronutrients not macronutrients. I know there's like the 80, 10, 10 diet and that like shoves in you, you know, 80% carbs, 10% fat, 10% protein, and this is how we need to eat. But they don't really talk about what, how do you get those numbers? Like what foods are you getting? I mean, once again, you could eat, you know, bananas, dates, and romaine lettuce every night and you could meet 80, 10, 10. But to me, that's a very deficient diet in terms of phytonutrients, phytochemicals. These are like vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, and polyphenols, yes. It's going to be loud. All right. And this video will be on YouTube if you want to review it later. And I will give you a handout if you'd like a handout because you're having problems hearing. So you could follow along. All right, can everybody hear me now? <laughs> now they need to turn it down with another speaker, they had to turn it up. All right, so we wanna focus on macronutrients, micronutrients, not macronutrients. Uh, instead, you wanna be aware of phytonutrients, vitamin, minerals, antioxidants, polyphenols, color, etc. Each food has a unique health providing properties. So, you know, you don't have to study every food like I have to know, like I Google and look at like, you know, published scientific journals on like, hey, what benefits do blueberries have? If I'm making an Instagram post, which you guys should follow me on Instagram, instagram.com slash growing your greens. Before I post an Instagram post, I'd be like, okay, I took a picture of jackfruit. And so I go to like PubMed and I Google, I, I, I search for jackfruit, like what unique properties in jackfruit that I didn't know about before and then I'll post that in my Instagram so that people follow me on Instagram could not only see a cool picture of jackfruit, but also learn about this cool phytonutrient that can protect you from cancer or who knows what it's gonna do. And uh, you know, every food has unique nutrients that I want you guys to include. Unfortunately, this is not talked about enough, 
I guess an easy way to know without researching every possible food is to look at the color of the food. Every different food color has different phytonutrients in there. So, you know, try to vary the different colors. Like, you know, I was actually at the, at the uh, where was I? Oh, I was in Loma Linda, actually. I was in Loma Linda yesterday, and they had the, the local health food store there had, like, not just regular white cauliflower. They had yellow cauliflower and then the really exciting cauliflower, the purple cauliflower. How many people have you had the purple cauliflower? All right, good. Well, a good number, you guys. You guys are advanced. All right. But yeah, I would always choose purple cauliflower over the white because they have the purple anthocyanins, which I've looked up the data, looked up the research, and it's, they're so healing and beneficial. You know, instead of getting orange carrots, um, you know, get the purple carrots, which are my favorite carrots, which I will, if, if I see them in a health food store, I'm going to buy, buy them all if they're selling them in bulk, <laughs> not in the bunches because they're cheaper in bulk if they do sell them, which is rare. Uh, the next uh, way is, I want you guys, number four, is source the best quality food you could buy, right? This can be quite difficult, right? There's the whole conundrum between organic and conventional. In some studies, conventional is better. In some studies, organic is better. I like to think that overall, organic is generally healthier for you than conventional. I mean, just aside from the nutrients in there, it's just the, it's like the pesticides, the really super toxic pesticides that are in the conventional foods that are really not good for us. You know, a lot of these are neurotoxins for insects, which may translate into neurotoxins for us, plus with all the issues with glyphosate and Roundup as a ripening agent. Yes, they use Roundup on even some fresh fruits and vegetables as a ripening agent, sometimes I've learned, which is quite scary. So for that reason alone, you should try to buy organic whenever you're able. And I know some of you guys out there in YouTube land may not be as lucky as the people here in San Diego and not be able to get organics, um, but, but even if you can't get organic and you're still eating conventional produce, just know this, that conventional produce is still basically better and healthier than anything else at the grocery store, despite any pesticides that may be still existing on there and just do your best to wash them off. Some of them kind of get systemic in the plant, um, you know, and so my message is do the best you can with that. Now, aside from organic versus conventional, now you could have store versus farmer's market or industrial grown produce versus farmer's market. So I generally like to think that farmer's market produce is generally better than store-bought produce uh, for three reasons, because store-bought produce is generally big agro, agro company farms that are just big commercial operations. They're not just like your small town grower unless you have a really cool co-op that actually buys from local sellers and sells it, maybe like ocean, uh, people's co-op down in the ocean here. Um, uh, so yeah, the farmer's market, always a better source. Plus, if you're buying at the farmer's market, usually it's picked you know, the day of or the day before. So always ask the vendor when the food was picked. Because a after food is picked, it starts to degrade. If you're buying apples in the store right now, the majority of the apples in the store right now are being uh, either imported or are from last year. Uh, the US harvest that's been in cold storage in an oxygen deprived environment. So they'll keep their texture and they get really mealy. And always this time of year, I get a lot of questions for my juicer company. John, man, I'm juicing and my juicer's making a lot more pulp in the juice than normal. That's because the apples you're using are literally like almost a year old now. They've lost their texture. They don't juice as well. And that's why you're getting more pulp in your juice now, even though you're juicing the same exact thing. Your juicer's not going bad. But as time goes on too, like um, the nutrient, nutrition levels go down as well. And then after that, we have a comparison between like farmer's market versus homegrown. So yes, farmer's market is definitely in most cases better than the store, but homegrown is even better than the farmer's market because now like in my backyard, I grow the, the majority of my vegetables that I eat and they're not harvested until I'm going to eat them like five minutes later. So now I'm maximizing nutrition and also in my garden, I can add, you know, nutrition to the soil and really foster and take care of the soil microbiome, the bacteria, the fungi in the soil, as well as the trace minerals that most farmers are not adding things in. And then even beyond that, we have wild versus homegrown, you know, wild food. So I was just out in this garden here, which I'll share some of the exotic vegetables that I've uh, picked today to share. I don't have some for everybody, but some people could get a little taste and I'll explain what they are. But there's wild foods, and so some people would argue with me, John, wild foods, man, they're better than homegrown foods because wild foods are just natural. They have more phytochemicals because just the fact that they're wild. But the thing I'd like to say is that, you know, in, in the wild, you can't control the soil. You can't control, you know, the minerals in the soil. And in many cases, it may be better than homegrown. 
but my goal is to like go to the wild, get the seeds, bring them back to my garden in soil that I know is rich, nutritious, the best soil I could have that hopefully in my opinion will exceed even wild grown stuff. And you know, I think a big challenge in, in the community is people don't eat enough wild foods that are just super nutritious because we, we're stuck with going to the farmer's market or going to Whole Foods and buying maybe like up to two, 200 varieties of plants that are cultivated and sold in commerce when there are, if you go to a website, PFAF, Plants for a Future database, there's over 5,000 different foods on the planet that, that, is, that are edible. And how many of those have you had? I'm working my way to, towards 5,000. I'm not, not even close. I probably maybe over maybe over 2,000. I still got so many I haven't eaten, but I always try to you know, purchase plants and buy things that I haven't eaten before. And so, oh, and that's where my uh, handout comes in. For those of you guys that have one, I will hold it up so you guys can see. So how do you know if a food is higher quality or not, right? So number one, I'll give you guys the easiest and cheapest thing to do is your taste buds. Our taste buds are the best indicators. And I'm not necessarily talking about like people will judge fruit on its sweetness. I'm not talking about necessarily sweetness, although that could be an indicator. Um, you know, I really want you guys to think about the flavor depth, you know, besides just being like, you know, oh, this grape is sweet. Is it just sweet? Does it taste like you're eating table sugar or does it taste like, like a fruity flavor? Does it, does it taste like a wine when you formally drank wine? Because I know you guys don't drink wine because that's not a health food in my opinion. Um, but it, all those wine varietals, those wine grapes have really nice intense flavors plus they have the sugar and I think it's a crime that they sell these stupid table grapes that are seedless that may be sweet but they have like zero flavor when they grow all these wine grapes and they make wine into them that have all these amazing flavors that get fermented, the sugars get fermented out, and then you have the flavor left from the grapes where we should be eating, you should be, we should be trying to buy wine grapes to like eat because they have so much more depth of flavor. And these depth of flavors you're tasting are actually the phytonutrients that are missing in the food. So I mean, wine grape growers know that there's a t thing called terroir and terroir, and I'm hopefully saying that right, is like the quality of the soil that makes the grape taste really good so that they have good wine. But this is, we also want this terroir when we're growing like fruits and vegetables so that they'll have higher levels of phytonutrients. So taste is really important. And uh, let's see here, uh, taste, color, another indicator, and fresh picked. So yeah, color, if you guys are picking apples at the store, you know, in the same, of the same type. So for example, you're picking red delicious apples. You know, there's red delicious apples that may be kind of like more on the yellow green side and there may be ones in the same bin that are more like deep red. So you always want to try to pick the deeper red ones. Um, you know, they're going to be more antioxidant rich and maybe even a little bit riper. Although most apples in the stores, I mean, sometimes when I bite into them and usually I don't eat apples from the store, I only juice them because they're just so bad. Um, they're kind of even have a green tinge and that's because they're picked early. And here's a, here's a ticket on industrial grown food you know, for their produce to survive so the company, the farmers don't lose their profits, they pick things early. So like, you know, a prematurely picked green, a li little bit green tinged apple on the inside will store a lot better under cold storage in an oxygen deprived environment than a ripe apple, obviously, because once it starts to ripe, it starts to break down. This is where there's more nutrition in there, but it also doesn't store as well either. And another way to uh, test your foods is actually through the bricks tester. And I didn't bring my bricks tester with me, but it, it's a little refractometer. Um, it looks like a little ish, instrument that you'll put, drop a few drops of the juice on. I give a whole t hour talk on the bricks uh, meter and do testing and stuff. I do have videos on that online if you guys want to look at my OK Raw YouTube channel. But you'll just put a couple drops of the fruit juice. And I know for some of you guys, this copy that didn't come out because the printer ran out of toner at the... Uh, at the hotel this morning. Um, but anyways, you put a couple of drops. Of, well, let me explain what BRICS is. So BRICS is within a given species of plant, the crop with a higher refractive index or BRICS will have a higher sugar content, but that's not it. That's not everything. Higher mineral content, higher protein content and greater specific gravity or density. This adds up to a sweeter tasting, more minerally nutritious fruit food with lower nitrate and water um, content and have a lower freezing point and better storage attributes. So that's important for farmers because also higher bricks also means more disease resistance so they don't have to spray as much because plants should have their own innate immune system that resists the bugs 
Um, but unfortunately, when you have inferior plants that don't have enough nutrition, you know, they're more susceptible to getting sick or disease. Much like people, right? If you eat a junk food diet, you're more susceptible to getting sick. And if you're eating, you know, high antioxidant, high rich fruit and vegetable diet, you know, you're, you're rarely if ever going to be sick, in my opinion, and based on my personal experience. So, uh, you know, for example, if we pick up an apple from the store, like most apples from the store that I test um, might be like 10 or 11 on the brick scale. A poor apple is 6, an average apple is 10, a good apple is 14, but an excellent apple is 18. How many of you guys ever tasted an excellent apple that's 18? So you've actually tested the bricks and eaten it, and you're like, wow, this is a good apple, I'm going to test it, it's 18. Because the other thing is, like, we don't have a good sense of what a bricks number is because we haven't looked at the bricks and then eaten the fruit, right? This is a common problem I have, and I could get into arguments. I've gotten into arguments with ex-girlfriends, and that's not necessarily why they're my ex-girlfriends at this point. Um, that like, They're like, oh, this is such a good peach, and I'm eating the peach. I'm like, that's ah, a mediocre peach. I mean, I'm a fruit snob, I can't help it. I've had a lot of experience in eating a lot of fruit. But it's because you don't have a good reference point. So your taste buds could lie to you, because if you have the best apple you've ever eaten, and you think, oh man, this is such a good apple, but you test the bricks and it's like 14, that's only a good apple, you could have 18, or you could have an apple that's 20. What did I have recently? Oh, I had a Chirimoya that was like 32, which is like totally off the chart, like super high. It's like. Oh my God, this is like Nirvana right here in the fruits. Because it was uh, exceeding the highest bricks that it could even be. Actually, I had some cherries up in Utah that were like that, actually. Yeah, it's amazing. But I mean, so the higher the bricks, the more minerally dense, the more nutritious it is, and the better tasting it is. And I'm not just meaning just sugar content, although bricks has a component of the sugar content. But my goal is our taste buds should be refined enough to know I would recommend everybody getting a refractometer. It's called a Bricks Meter, zero to 32. They're like maybe $20 on Amazon. Make sure you get one good for fruit. So you could test it. And you could even Bricks test your vegetables too, which I have done. You basically have to juice your vegetable and then put a little bit of the juice. I mean, I'm really spoiled by having my own organic, beyond organic garden in my backyard, not certified. By eating some of the food I eat because my cabbage and kale leaves are so sweet. And you know, some of the like uh, vegetables, for example, kale. Poor kale could be eight, average kale could be 10, good kale could be 12, and really excellent kale could be 16. And we talk about apples, like apples, excellent apples are 18, but good kale could be 16, just two points lower. Um, you know, and so good kale could taste really good, but when you buy kale at the store, it's like old, maybe even starting to yellow for those of you guys that aren't living in California where it's, you know, going across the country in the winter time and it just starts to taste horrible as it degrades and just the fresh picked baby kale leaves, which I encourage you guys, if you're eating whole greens to pick baby leaves, because they digest a lot better, they're a lot more nutritious, it's where a lot of the growth oxins and things are in the plant. But if you're juicing them or making smoothies and you're gonna break them up, then I like to harvest the mature leaves. So I harvest mature and um, you know, young leaves depending on what I'm making. So yeah, bricks is really important. Now, why is bricks so important? Why am I a big bricks fan? Well, that's the back of this chart that you guys could look at if you were lucky enough to get one. And uh, this is basically a test of grocery store green beans and garden beans on this chart. The grocery store is on this side. The garden beans are on this side. And the grocery store beans were bricks 4.2 and the garden beans were bricks 6.1. So that's only like two points higher. But what difference did it make? Well, the taste, number one, on the taste, the taste for the grocery store beans were garbage, and that's, you know, a, not really, that's, a, you know, quantifiable by the person tasting it, and the taste on the garden beans were decent. And if you tasted probably these same two bricks numbers, you would be like, wow, these garden beans actually taste good. I'll tell you, I was out in like, was it somewhere weird, Minneapolis, Minnesota, and I found a high bricks asparagus grower. And he was handing samples out at the, at the farmer's market because most people aren't just gonna sit and buy asparagus. It's like, oh, you either eat asparagus or you don't. But he was handing out samples because he knew his asparagus was high bricks, really sweet, and if you tasted it, you will buy it. And he was quite successful at doing that. I would see that he would give samples and like, you know, the majority of the people after he gave a sample would buy his asparagus. So then I had to taste it and I tasted it like, wow, this is the best asparagus I've ever ate to find out that he's really into growing nutrient-dense foods, which unfortunately most farmers are not. They're not aware of this or they don't know how to do this. There's a few farmers that are and they're far and few in between. 
And I was like, wow, that's amazing. And the reason why it's so important, besides the taste is garbage or decent, is the nutritional quality, which is right on the bottom. And this is what I really want to create awareness about, which is really not talked about in the movement so much. And it's all about the trace minerals. You know, I recently had a blood test and I tested my zinc. And, you know, as a vegan, you know, people that are vegan may be deficient in zinc. Um, I'm glad to say that my zinc levels were fine. And, you know, that's because of my diet, but I don't eat just a raw food, fruit and vegetable based diet. I eat a lot of homegrown food where I actually add zinc and other trace minerals into my soil so that I get these in the foods that I'm eating so I could absorb them in the most natural way possible. But for example, on zinc, on this nutritional quality, um, the zinc of the grocery store is maybe, I don't know, seven points if you're lucky. And the zinc in the garden beans that are higher bricks um, are over 20. So that's almost like a 21, maybe a threefold increase of zinc. You know, if you look at the uh, calcium, the calcium in the grocery store beans that tasted garbage that were 4.2 bricks are maybe about 70. And if you look at the ones that are garden beans, homegrown, rich soil, they're like 130. So that's almost twice as much calcium. So where do vegans get their calcium from? Are you getting them from grocery store beans that have half as much calcium for the same quantity of garden bean? You know, and are you deficient in, in, in calcium? <laughs> Protein, even protein, check this out, protein's cool. Protein, you know, the grocery store bean, maybe like nine, and the garden bean has almost maybe 36. Um, oh no, sorry, it's, it's 18 versus maybe 36, so maybe about a two-fold increase, just in the amount of protein. So, you know, I like to get my protein from the greens, and depending on how the green or the plant was grown, it could have more or less protein, and here's a tip that I connected later, is that higher protein containing plants get attacked by bugs and pests less. Pests cannot, but little simple bugs cannot digest more complex proteins, whereas animals and mammals and we can. So if you're eating, you know, if you have a lot of bugs and things in your garden, they're eating all your vegetables, you need to definitely increase the quality of the soil to increase your plant health, which will in the end increase your health. So yeah, I'm super big on sourcing the best, or uh, ex, uh, sourcing the best, wait, where was I? Yeah, sourcing the best quality of food you could buy, which includes even growing it yourself. And that's why I'm a big advocate of growing your own food, also to be connected with the food system. I'm not gonna judge people that don't eat any animal, I'm not gonna judge people that eat animal products, but I will say that I want vegans and animal product eaters to be connected with your food. If you're gonna eat animals, I believe, you should raise your own chickens and chop their heads off and kill them and then eat them. You shouldn't just buy them, you know, cut up already in the store in a nice package where all that work is done for you because you are disconnected with your food. Likewise, I don't want vegans to, you know, just buy processed vegan food made in a, in a factory. I want you guys to make it yourself. I mean, I mean, the next thing is for people into plant-based diet, raw food, fruit and vegetable diet, you know, I don't want you guys to buy all your food from the grocery store. I want you guys to grow at least a little bit of it. Um, you know, even if you're just growing sprouts and microgreens, which you can do indoors. You know, I don't expect everybody to grow 100% of their food. It's not realistic, but I think this disconnection with food, where food comes from, how it's processed is a big disconnect. I'm not advocating anybody eat animals, uh, but I am saying that if you, you know, I believe that if everybody had to raise their own chickens in their backyard and slaughter them, or process them, whatever nice words you want to use. Like, I could not do that. I could not kill a chicken and eat it. I'd eat the grass before I ate the chicken. I think there'd be a lot more, you know, plant-based vegan eaters in the world if we had to raise our own foods and we're connected with them better. Number five, I want you to expand your palate of fruit and vegetables you guys eat. So what does that mean? You know, if you always eat the same fruits and vegetables, like a lot of Americans have a shopping list and every week when they go to Whole Foods, they buy their celery, they buy their kale, they buy their apples or oranges or bananas. And during the week, that's what they eat, right? They don't eat new and different seasonal fruits and vegetables. You know, on the drive down, I live in Las Vegas, I drove down, I stopped at Exotica Fruit Tree Nursery to see my friend, uh, you know, Steve up there. And I got a nice tour of the garden because I made videos promoting them. So, you know, uh, you know, and I got to sample some of the in-season ripe fruits. I got to sample tropical apricot, which I maybe had once before in my life. But that, that food, 
the tropical apricot, it's not related to a standard apricot. It had an incredible flavor and different nutrients in there than a standard apricot. You know, I had these, it's called cactus blueberries. So there's like these little blueberries that grow on a cactus plant and I got to eat one of those, you know, it's like, there's so many different foods that we do not, we have not ever tasted and each food has different vitamins, minerals, phytochemicals, phytonutrients, not to mention taste sensations to make a taste explosion in your mouth. You may find, you know, some of these new foods you may really like a lot, some of them you may not like a lot, but if you've never tried them, you will never know. And so, uh, you know, just like if you are a painter, and I'm not a painter, I'm not an artist, so I'm probably gonna mess this up, but if you're a painter and you have one of those old easel boards where you gotta put the primary colors, I don't know what they are, red, yellow, I'm not, green, I don't know. But to make different colors, to have a nice painting with all the different colors, you have to take a little bit of the white to mix it with the, the yellow to make a lighter yellow, and you have to mix this color with that color to get all the different spectrum of colors. You know, we need to eat all the different foods you know, uh, to get all the different phytonutrients and nutrients into us. So I want to encourage everybody to eat new fruits and vegetables you've never tried before for additional phytochemicals and nutrients that have different roles in the body. That's very important, both discovered and undiscovered. You know, they've done a lot of research with different plants. I mean, plants are nothing more than chemical factories, whether it's a fruit or whether it's a leafy green or herb. Plants are chemical factories. They're out there making chemicals from the soil, from the sun, from all the different influences and those chemicals in the plants are not for our benefit, they're for the plant's benefit, to protect the plants from the sun. I mean, I live in Vegas, it's 100 degrees now for the last maybe month, all my plants are getting full sun, UV, except for the ones under my reflective shade cloth, but one half of my garden gets full sun, and they have to protect themselves from sunburn. So I make them deal with full sun so that they can produce more of these phytochemicals, and when I eat my kale or collard greens in the summertime, in full sun, it's a lot different experience than eating my kale or collard greens in the wintertime when they actually get sweet. In the summertime, they're a lot more stronger and bitter flavor. And these are the protection that it's getting, so it protects itself from the sun, which then when I eat these kale plants that are high nutrient dense, then those nutrients go into me. They might turn my skin a little bit more orange tins, the zeaxanthin, the you know, lutein that go to my eyes to protect my eyes. Um, so important. Uh, yeah, so a, a place you could easily do this is shop at Asian and ethnic markets. You will have a wider, you know, scope of different, le especially leafy greens that you would not be available to find at like a standard health food store. Of course, growing your own is the best, and I will talk about a few just out in the garden here. I mean, I really love this fruit festival because it's nice, nice and home, homey and small, so it's not like most more personal attention than like 500 people where it just gets totally crazy. Plus, there's a, literally a food forest right outside or children's garden. How many people have walked through the garden or the forest here? That's so good, a handful of people. But it's like I found it or I was told about it because I didn't know. And I was like, oh, my God, this place is so amazing. I was just walking around just like to chill out in between talks and stuff over there. And there's a lot of cool food growing. It's not just like a regular garden or something to teach kids with just standard vegetables and fruits. They have a lot of cool things that will grow really easily here in the San Diego area. With a lot, without a lot of care, and actually that's a pro and a con. That garden, in my opinion, does not get as much attention as it should be getting to thrive optimally. But even though, even that, a neglected garden that's taken care of half ass, sorry, um, you know, still has plenty of food growing, and some things are doing well. And this just shows us what plants are really strong and resilient that you could grow without taking much care of them. And uh, these are some of them right here. Some of them I have, some for sampling, and some of them I don't. I will hand them all around. Um, to you guys, and you could try some, or I don't know, or, or not. <laughs> but how many of you guys have eaten like fresh go-to cola? Cool, you guys are cool. But go-to cola, if you go to the health food store, um, you know it's sold in a capsule form or a dry bulk herb form. But this plant will actually take over an area. It's actually quite invasive, and it'll just root up and start growing everywhere in this climate zone. I mean, if you live somewhere where it freezes, this guy is not going to take a freeze. But these greens I love to add just to my salads, so now I have the benefits of the go-to cola. What are some of the benefits of go-to cola? I mean, the one that I remember the most, of course, people pointed to their brains, is memory. These are good for memory. You know, the same properties are not in lettuce if you're just eating lettuce salads every day. So, you know, sometimes I don't make straight go-to cola salads because some of these sold as herbals or medicinals, you know, for people are quite strong. So, you know, I would encourage people to harvest a few leaves and have these, a few leaves, you know, 
occasionally in your salads with romaine and with other more mild vegetables so that you get some of these in you, but then you're not getting a big dose because some of these more wild foods or herbals shouldn't be eaten in high quantities and some of them do need to be heat processed to be cooked to get some of the toxins out of them. I will not be talking about any of the ones that you need to heat process. All of these can be safely eaten raw. So we'll hand this around. I don't know if somebody wants to uh, try this or eat this. Uh, there may be some bugs on it, so I'd wipe it off first. <laughs> it's uh, fully organic. This one is one of my favorite ones that I was really excited to see that they have out there. Um, this one is actually called Okinawan spinach. Maybe it's because it's from Okinawa, Japan. And uh, it, it's a um, really cool kind of more succulent flavor. And the reason why John Kohler likes this is one of his favorites that I'm having a challenge growing in Vegas because it is quite hot. This plant is a shade lover is because of the back deep purple leaves. When there's purple in there, there's anthocyanins. This is purple pigments. And um, these are quite healthy and really good for us. I try to eat as many purple pigments as I possibly could get. Uh, I don't remember the research and what this is specifically good for, but if you Google this, it's known as Janeira bicolor. I'm sure there's many uh, you know, benefits that Asians have determined on this plant. Uh, the next one that's closely related to that one that grows really well, I have a whole fence full in Vegas. This one doesn't like below 33 degrees, so if it gets to 32, this plant is not making it. Uh, so all times of the year, for the most part, aside from the deep winter, I could keep this alive by just covering it. This is known as longevity spinach or Janeira procumbens. So this one likes full sun, deals with full sun. The salad that I'm going to eat tonight for dinner was harvested from my garden. I made it, I vacuum sealed it, and I'm eating it tonight. Has a bunch of these leaves in here. Let's see, I think they call this the cholesterol lowering plant. And you know, this is not the solution if you guys are eating, you know, uh, animal products and getting high cholesterol. This is to keep your cholesterol in check as a plant-based eater. You know, I have seen some instances where if you eat too much fruit and you're not metabolizing properly, you may, your cholesterol and triglycerides may be high. And uh, you know, and actually that was a challenge I had with one of my blood tests. My triglycerides were high, so I had to really back off on eating as much fruit and focus on more vegetables and especially some of these more healing vegetables like this. The cool thing about this plant and the last one going around is that you just literally take a cutting like this and you stick it in dirt and then it roots and then it will grow a new plant. So some of these are really easy to propagate or to grow yourselves. How many of you guys have had, I should be calling out, how many people have had Okinawan spinach here? Nobody, good. How many people have had longevity spinach or Janeiro procumbens? Nobody, that's good. So yeah, I'm glad I, I like to, I mean, this has really been my study and area. I like, I mean, aside from, I mean, these are 10 points and this is just one of my points and like so many people haven't even had these. So hopefully this next plant, I have a lot, so more of you guys could sample because they had a lot out there. Um, let me, let's see here, I'm mixing them up. So this plant actually, this, if you own property here in San Diego or Southern California, this is one of the ones you definitely want to grow. I mean, the other two you should grow also. But this one's like a no-brainer. I mean, if you guys go outside, you can see all the trees and, you know, the grass. It all grows year-round. This is also one in Southern California without a frost. will go year-round as a tree, and it's very low-maintenance. You literally plant it once. It's basically impervious to most pests and common diseases. And it's known as Moringa. How many people have had Moringa before? How many people have had fresh Moringa before? Not in a powder. Cool. So some of you guys. But yeah, fresh Moringa is amazing. And it's called the tree of life. And it has, you know, more whatever calcium than carrots and all these crazy things. And you could buy powder. And, you know, when you go to the health food store and buy powder, they basically just take the leaves, dry them, powder them. And then they sell them to you for like $30 a pound when you could have a tree that literally just grows outside your door. You could go and harvest them like I can in the summertime. And I just add them to juices, add them to salads. And I like to pick the baby top leaves that are a lot more tender. And so that's what I've done here. They're a little bit wilted. I just picked them like, you know, 10 minutes before my talk began. But pick off a leaf. One of the things I found out about Moringa is that much like the cruciferous family of vegetables, they also contain uh, the anti-cancer properties. And that'll give, it, that'll give it a little bit of that bite that you're tasting when you're getting there, in there. Another one, this is a little bit more common. How many of you guys have purslane come up in your garden? How many people have eaten purslane? I mean, like every hand should go up. This is such a common leafy green that you know is available in any Mexican market for the most part. I mean if you go to the farmer's market I think I saw some purslane for sale today, some really nice um, cultivated purslane. This is more of a wild type that has smaller leaves. This is the kind that I grow every year in my garden, not by choice but because it comes back every year and I just let it come back. And you know when it's in season, which for me in Vegas because it's so hot, this is a springtime 
plant right as it gets hot. This always will cover my ground right below my peppers, which is good to cover the ground and have uh, edible mulch and a ground cover, but also this plant is very high in omega-3 fatty acids, acids which are good for our brain and many other uh, things in our life. So you guys could try some fresh purslane. That will, will recede easily, and once you grow it once, it'll probably just, you won't be able to get rid of it, which could be a good or a bad thing, depending on how you look at it. A weed is only a weed if it's in an undesirable spot. All right, so uh, yeah, this next one here. Oh yeah, okay, yeah, so this next one here. Uh, these leaves are kind of getting wilted now, but how many of you guys have seen, how many of you guys have eaten this one? This is nasturtium leaves. One person, you're cool, two, three, all right, a couple people. Nasturtium leaves are amazing. Most people eat nasturtium flowers, which are edible flowers, which are known as edible and they're delicious. But nasturtium leaves, I have to look this one up and do a nice Instagram post to see what's in there because I don't really know. But it has a nice peppery flavor and I'm sure that peppery flavor has some kind of good cool health benefit. And these make awesome wraps. Like I have, I've had some uh, uh, of these leaves that are like maybe like this and you could literally use them as a little tortilla wrap or ravioli wrap and a nice hot and spicy flavor. And these guys pretty much, these are growing wild out there. They grow wild in California and many places because you plant them once and they have these little seeds that are cool that you could eat it. You could also eat the seeds raw. They're kind of also has a hot, spicy flavor. They pickle them as like poor man's capers, they call them. But yeah, that's a, a really cool one. Oh, and then this guy. I mean, oops, I dropped it. <laughs> this is another cool one. How many of you guys eaten this one? This is uh, actually, um, grape leaves. So we've eaten grapes. Everybody probably here has eaten grapes. But how many people have eaten grape leaves? So if you've ever eaten dolmas, you have had grape leaves. But you could also eat grape leaves raw. I do not recommend necessarily making a salad out of this stuff. But they are raw and they are edible. You know, and I wouldn't, you know, I just eat a little bit here and there. I don't know the properties in grape leaves, but I saw that out there. And I want to just, I mean, there's so many, once again, there's so many foods that you guys are not aware of. Yeah, we get to buy the grapes in the store, but, you know, maybe in a certain, you know, uh, ethnic markets like... You know, they, they might sell grape leaves so that you could make your own domos, but people don't eat them raw. Add some to a green smoothie is a perfect way to eat some of these things. The last one I have is for the daring and adventurous. So this one, uh, you know, if you do eat this, it's really strong, hot flavored. This one is known as Cuban oregano. So this is a more a medicinal. You know, if you love oregano, you will probably love this. You only want to take off a little pinch of this leaf because it's going to light up your mouth. And that's why I saved it to last. But also, you know, things that have a stronger flavor also have more phytonutrients. And once again, this is another easy one, especially in California with the drought. You could literally root this and it's a drought tolerant. So in Vegas in the summertime, this thing just takes off and just grows by the bunches. I, I don't use it as fast as I can grow it uh, because it is so strong. I might only put a leaf or two literally in a salad dressing to basically blow up the salad. I mean, if you're making like a Italian seasoning, you could use this if you don't have oregano. So you guys could send that, I'll send that around. So yeah, so I mean, these are just a few things I saw outside that I wanted to bring in to sample you guys, but there's so many more thousands of foods that you guys could be eating. And unless you grow them yourself or have access to a cool farm or garden or the wild or a park where they don't spray things, you'll never get to try these foods and you'll never have the access to the nutrients in those foods that are both researched and unresearched. I mean, some of these foods are from Asia and other countries. Wow, I'm already been talking so long already. <laughs> All right, I better move on because I have five minutes left. <laughs> All right, um, let's see. So, yeah, expand your palate of fruits and vegetables as you've tasted. A lot of these foods are totally unique, different tastes, and have different nutrients. Uh, number six is process your own food. Don't buy packaged foods, you know. And that's something huge, especially with the millennial generation. I think we're, we've gotten away from making our own foods and people would rather just buy a pre-made juice instead of make it themselves. Um, you know, packaged foods benefit the company, not you, because they're there to make a profit. You know, it also creates plastic waste, and in many cases, you know, they're using salt, sugar, and cheap fillers to give a product so that they can maximize their profit. So process your own food. Number seven, use the best processing techniques, right? And the best processing techniques for your food are our teeth, which are our free juicers. I will never, even though I sell juicers, I will always tell you to use your teeth first because that is the natural way to digest and break down food. The challenge is I want you guys to use your teeth properly, which means to chew every mouthful into a mush. It's easy with fruits because you don't have to chew them as much. But with vegetables, I mean, if you're swallowing big chunks of vegetables like leaves, you'll see them coming out 
on the other side when you go to the toilet. And if you're seeing vegetables come out whole or in chunks, that means you are not digesting them and you will, might as well not be eating them. That's why I like to process my own food you know, in the blender or juicers if I don't feel like chewing, which you know, it'll take me like a good hour to chew my food. I eat rather slow, which is a good and bad thing depending on how you look at it. Number seven, this is super important, is use the best processing techniques. You know, um, oh wait, wait, no, I talked about that. <laughs> oh wait, wait, did I? Oh no, I said process your own food. So yeah, number seven is use the best processing techniques. And uh, yeah, so that actually was the, the good old fashioned chewing your food properly. Um, low speed juicing versus high speed juicing. So, you know, uh, if you juice in a brebble, hey, that's great because you're drinking juice, which is better than not drinking juice. But if you use a slow juicer, such as the Green Star Pro or a slow juicer, you're gonna maximize more of the phytonutrients in there. I've done many tests where I show this. There's scientific studies that prove this in terms of antioxidants. Um, also, something like vacuum blending. How many people own a vacuum blender? Wow, zero, that's sad. How many people are familiar with what vacuum blending is? Well, so cool, some of you guys watch my videos. So I would encourage everybody to vacuum blend because you preserve more phytonutrients or specifically antioxidants, probably not minerals, probably not other things, but also has a, be a better taste, flavor, texture. Um, you know, as time goes on, vacuum blenders will get cheaper and they will be more widely available. You could lose like three times of the, some of the polyphenol in blueberries if you're blending blueberries in a standard Vitamix versus vacuum blending them, which I think is significant. Also, you're losing a lot of the flavor and storage capabilities after you are done blending. And then now the last one is freeze drying versus dehydration. I know, you know, when I got into uh, raw foods, dehydration was really big. And uh, everybody would dehydrate their food and kale chips and all these things. And you know, hey, while that's good because it's a way to preserve food, it's not the best. So recently now they have freeze dryers that are home freeze dryers. I bought one, I've had a lot of challenges with it. You could watch my videos, I can't really get into that. But now I get to freeze dry my food and make basically concentrated nutrients in my food, which is another tip. And so we're gonna throw some of these out there. These are freeze dried um, sweet cherries. So I mean, this is miss missing the water content. I don't recommend living on freeze dried cherries because you're missing the water content. <laughs> But they are basically now, because I'm taking out the water, they're packed with phytonutrients, and they got you know, different uh, nutrients in there. Can't throw them out to everybody. Maybe I'll throw a couple more, because I gotta keep talking. I'm almost out of time here. Cherry bomb. Cherry bomb. All right, and somebody's gonna be really lucky. This is, not this is still nutrient dense, because the water is missing, but it's freeze-dried jackfruit. And this tastes like, maybe I'll break it in a half. This, to me, tastes like a fortune cookie. So I actually, what I do for fun, is I try to freeze dry whole jackfruit pods and I could slip a fortune in there and then, uh, and then eat it and it's like so amazing. So let's see here, man. I don't know how far we can fling a jackfruit piece. <laughs> Hit the floor, all right, go to the back there. But yeah, so I mean, I, I don't advocate the use of, you know, once again, a good, better, best. I'd rather eat any of this freeze dried stuff than McDonald's or a vegan tofu burger, but I'd rather eat fresh fruit or even a juice instead of my freeze dried stuff. But if I can't get enough fruit fresh, I could have freeze dried food that I've made at home where I could control the quality. You know, I have videos on how I freeze dry salad. So even I could eat my, my winter vegetables in the summertime, just add water and it keeps 99% of the nutrition or very high percent of the nutrition because it is done under vacuum while frozen, which is super cool. The machines have challenges. Uh, number eight, and I'm getting out of 10, is um, eat a percentage of concentrated foods. So, you know, because of the reasons I forementioned earlier, such as, you know, the quality of the food is not as good as it should, it doesn't have as much nutrients as it should, one of the ways you can increase the nutrients you're getting in, because I'm all about eating, you know, more nutrient-dense versus calorie-dense foods, that's something that's really important that I wish I knew this earlier in my raw foods journey, is, uh, you know, freeze-dried foods is a concentrated food because you're removing the water. That's the only, basically the only thing missing with a little bit of nutrition that is lost, but it's keeping the majority of the nutrition. For those of you guys that tried that, how did those guys taste? Yeah, amazing. I mean, that's like, it's my crack, but it's just, it's just fruit, man. It's so good. Um, so yeah, so you're increasing the volume of foods you could eat, you know, especially like green powders are basically concentrated greens if you are unable to get or eat certain greens. Um, also, I like to use the juicer. So the juicer removes some, but not all the fiber, depending on the produce, like pineapples are the worst to juice because that has very little soluble fiber. 
uh, get, get, that gets rid of most of the fiber in pineapples, but in you know, carrots, as I mentioned, it's, you're still keeping about half the fiber. But now I'm removing some of the extra bulk of the carrots so I could get more pounds of carrots into me. And you know, in the case of beets, I don't eat a lot of raw beets. But if, if I didn't juice beets, I probably wouldn't eat that many beets unless they're fermented, which is not too common. So now I'm able to increase my quantity of beets that, that aren't necessarily my favorite food to get those nutrients into me, which are good for the beta lanes and good for you know, your cardiovascular system and all these things. Sports performance, I mean, they do they dope with beet juice now, which is I fully approve of. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, juicing, it's also easier on the go. So like I brought, I drank three juices today because sometimes I just don't have time to sit down and eat a whole watermelon, but I could you know, slurp down a juice. But just because you could slurp down a juice doesn't mean you should drink it fast. Um, and then uh, let's see here, uh, eat concentrated foods. Uh, number nine is grow your own food. This is super important. I mean, you could ha uh, growing your own food allows you to have the healthiest food by number one, having access to food money can't buy. So you could grow all those things if you live here in San Diego really easily, even if you don't maintain your garden, um, you know, as they've proven here, and, and eat, be able to eat those foods on a regular and consistent basis. Number one, that's super important to me. Number two, you could add nutrients to the soil that farmers are not adding, such as the trace minerals. So you could, you're not going to be a deficient vegan, raw fruitarian, and make sure you get all your trace minerals not added to food normally. In addition, I didn't talk about earlier that food grown on standard NPK fertilizer may be quite imbalanced. This is totally advanced topic subjects, but could have higher nitrate levels and different levels based on the food is only good as the, as the, as the uh, fertilizer they're putting in. If they're focusing on three fertilizers, the food is going to be pretty imbalanced, in my opinion, compared to a food grown on, you know, 70 to 90 different trace minerals in nature's proportions in the form of, like, rock dust, which I use. Uh, number three, you, if you grow your own garden, you could pick your food at your peak ripeness or pick it at the stage you want. For example, kale, I like to pick baby leaves to eat, large leaves get blended or juiced. You know, if you're growing fruit trees and you get to pick your fruit at optimal ripeness, hopefully before the birds do or other vermin in your garden get it. That will mean more nutrition for you. And number four, ensuring your food is not sprayed with toxic pesticides. You know exactly how your food is grown and you get to control that exactly. And uh, number five, this is talked about a little bit earlier, you're eating the most microbiome abundant foods that live in your environment. I even pee on my plants. I'm not afraid to admit that, not on my vegetables usually or the leaves, but on my plants so that they're absorbing part of my energy and maybe my plants are going to grow and give me what it needs based on my pee, <laughs> which is also a nitrogen fertilizer, okay? And then uh, number 10, this is really important. This is emerging science, and I just want to make sure I mention this in my talk is I want you guys to eat for your microbiome. You know, all this research and these studies coming out, I try to stay up with the latest science and all these things, is that, you know, they say that now we are more bacteria than even human, right? And we, only di we don't really digest our food, our microbiome or the bi bacteria inside us do. So there are new tests that I hope to have a video on really soon where I get my microbiome tested. And, you know, each person could bacterial and fungi and microbiome could digest certain things better than others. And some things, even though you love eating blueberries, maybe they're not so good for you and you find strawberries, your microbiome accepts more instead of creating because your bacteria in your gut will basically digest the food you eat and make um, metabolites out of them. They'll make good things that are good for us like antioxidants, but they could also make some things that are not so good for us. So we want to try to feed our microbiome right. And this is totally next level stuff that actually I rarely hear about. And so that's very important. So, I mean, one way you could know is just by an inner sense of if your body's liking it, if you're digesting well, if you're getting a lot of gas and bloating. And, uh, you know, you could do a, a biome. It's called biome testing. So that's up, up on my list to do biome testing to see what my microbiome looks like. Obviously, if you're coming from a, you know, standard American diet to plant-based diet, you're having a lot of challenges. That's because your microbiome is used to eating junk food your whole life and now you're, you're piling in fruits and vegetables and your bacteria is going, oh my God, I, I can't digest this stuff because you, I have a microbiome for junk food or for animal products and you don't have the right microbiome. So slowly over time, as you increase your fruit and vegetable consumption slowly and moderately, which is the way I recommend getting into this diet, you will start populating with the right microbes and you'll crowd out the bad microbes that are used to eating your old diet. I don't have any time for questions and I think I even ran over a little bit. I will be hanging out here um, you know, around if you guys want to ask me questions. I also have a huge, maybe 25 pound watermelon. I'm glad to share with people because I know they don't have any fruit here. So I'm going to be sitting at one of those back tables and cutting open a watermelon. So anybody who wants to join me, 
come by and grab some watermelon and chat. Thank you so much.